Everybody welcome uh, back for day two of the Sustainable Cleveland uh, 2021 Virtual Summit. This is uh, the first of a series of panels on our Lead for City certification, um, where we really want to start to dive into uh, how we did as a city, um, where we scored well, maybe where we've got some room for improvement. Um, this will be followed by another panel where we'll talk about some of the innovative ways that folks are already working in our area to help us kind of grow and improve in some of those uh, challenging categories for us. And then it will link with a third session where we're going to spend a little bit of time thinking about how to ingrain um, lead for cities principles in our broader measurement um, uh, approach. Um, obviously, we want to thank our partners and friends at the Cleveland Public Library. Uh, without their support and help, this would not have been possible to do this in this virtual platform. So thank you to the Cleveland Public Library. Um, as David gets into his presentation, you can obviously kind of uh, make it a little bit bigger. If you'd like to see what he's showing on the screen here, you can kind of see on the side here um, how to unpin and turn into full screen. Um, it's a great way to kind of make it a little bit easier to see some of the items as, as we walk through those today. Um, you can also close the chat. Um, if you want to do that, you can kind of hit that arrow and that will close the chat, which will automatically make it a little bit bigger on the screen as well. If you do have questions, uh, we'd love to hear from you. So drop those in the chat box. We'll be monitoring them as we kind of go through the presentation. Um, and then after uh, David wraps up, we'll be able to uh, uh, answer some of those and kind of talk through uh, what we see and what we know. And obviously, of course, if you uh, haven't already done so, uh, feel free to connect with us on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, or subscribe to our blog and e-newsletter through our website, sustainablecleveland.org. Uh, I will stop sharing with that and introduce our, uh, our, our presenter, David Abel. Uh, David is the senior manager of the Lead for Cities at the U.S. Green Building Council and someone who over the last year and a half, everybody in the Office of Sustainability has gotten to know very well. Um, as we kind of worked through our Lead for Certification effort, David was with us the whole way, providing a tremendous amount of guidance and, and really helping us understand um, and complete our application, I think, in a, in a successful way. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to David and let him kind of take it away and talk a little bit about the, the process and, and what he saw in, in the Cleveland application. Thanks, Jason. Good morning, everyone. Nice to be here with you today. Um, yeah, so as Jason said, my name is David Abel, Senior Manager with the, the Lead for Cities program at USGBC. And my role is uh, really to work with local governments that are going through the program to help them um, do project management, address technical questions that come up. And I think someone recently in Florida was telling me that I, I serve as a, a counselor for all their worries and concerns as they, they don't think they're meeting the, the mark or falling behind. But uh, I'm really here to help coach along the way and ensure that um, they meet their goals as far as certification goes. Uh, my background is in urban planning and I've been working with local governments um, doing sustainability tracking since 2015. Um, I initially was a part of the, the STAR Communities Program um, and worked with dozens of governments around the country as a part of that, that team. And then in 2017, STAR joined USGBC and um, formed what is now Lead for Cities. So um, I've really enjoyed working with local governments to go through this kind of um, assessment and help them use the results to, to make improvements over time. I um, had the privilege, obviously, to work with Cleveland, but also in the state, Shaker Heights certified um, this past spring. So I worked with um, Michael Peters and the team in Shaker to help them along the way. And then Cincinnati certified um, two years ago around this time. Um, so good to see growth in Ohio and hopefully more will come along as well. So today um, I want to give you kind of a brief overview of Lead for Cities and, uh, and also talk a little bit about why communities choose to certify and then the dig in a bit on the, the Cleveland certification and, and please open things up for discussion. If you have chats that you want to, or questions along the way, drop them in the chat and I'm happy to kind of answer them, keep this um, conversational as much as possible and please just, yeah, go on. Uh, I guess, David, do you want me, if I see questions, do you want me to like jump in in the yeah. middle or, we, okay, great. Feel free to interrupt, that, that is perfectly fine. So um, yeah, I, I'm, and I didn't say I'm based in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, so not too far away. I have not made it to Cleveland before, but I had a, a good friend in grad school that was from Cleveland and her passion for the city definitely made me know it's a special place. And um, 
I think uh, she might be here today. I'm not sure, Emily Baca. So um, thanks for, for keeping Cleveland on my radar, Emily. So, all right, let's dig into it. So Lead for Cities um, is, is really the, the leading global rating system and certification program for evaluating sustainability and quality of life in a city or community, and um, it takes a multi-stakeholder approach. So it's really looking at um, not just the green side of sustainability, but also the economic and social aspects of it. No, you well. go. I, I'll get the next one. And really, the, the intention is to help cities use this as a tool as in a, a catalyst for transformative change um, to, to further equitability, resilience, and sustainable places. As I mentioned, um, you know, the, STAR, this is kind of an ongoing movement. In 2007, the STAR community rating system was created and born kind of out of, out of a need um, to support the burgeoning um, urban sustainability movement. STAR communities provided a framework and kind of a, a handbook for urban sustainability professionals to um, address sustainability holistically. Again, it, it was looking at not just recycling and energy, but um, issues around equity, um, the arts, health, uh, the economy, to really provide that, that guidance along the way. Um, in in uh, 2017-ish, STAR joined USGBC and worked to, to kind of use that experience along with the Lead for Cities pilot to create Lead for Cities version 4.1 in, in 2019 is when we launched. So important to note here that um, Cleveland certified in 2014 under the STAR Communities Program as a three-star community. And I think that that commitment to use a third-party verification to um, kind of track progress along the way and, and help guide the work is really um, one, of, one of the things that is um, a hallmark for Cleveland. And, and as Jason said yesterday in his opening that, you know, for the past decade or so, Cleveland has been a leader in the forefront of sustainability, and that's reflected in these ongoing commitments to certifications. So um, Lead for Cities is guided by a, a really broad group of, of experts, both practitioners, academics, and consultants in the field. And um, this stakeholder group, the Cities and Communities Working Group, um, helps to ensure that what we're measuring is in line with what is happening in practice and that we're on the cutting edge of urban sustainability and, and always remaining um, relevant and evolving as the field evolves. So this, this broader group helps to, to um, guide that growth and evolution. And it's a part of a, a larger USGBC um, kind of infrastructure of integrity um, to get right now, the Lead for Cities rating system is in what we call beta. So it's being used by, by dozens of governments and we're learning along the way. We can make tweaks on our quarterly agenda process for credits that might not work. And we'll touch on that a little bit later. But um, we have different processes and committees in place to ensure that the rating system has um, strong integrity and um, is, is, the, is measuring sustainability in the right way. So who's using Lead for Cities? We have over 130 certified cities and communities around the globe and over 250 registered. As you can see on the map, there's really a concentration in the United States um, and that is, that is the local governments that have certified. Um, around the globe, we have places like um, Dubai, Sapporo, Surat, and Savona as global cities that have certified. And um, we take pride that we do align with the UN Sustainable Development Goals that as global cities are hoping to reach these goals and align with them, the Lead for Cities rating system can help track progress there. And one of our main ways of engagement with US local governments is through our, our leadership program. Um, th this has been going on for um, four different rounds. We'll have another one in 2022, but um, Shaker Heights and Cincinnati were a part of our 2019 group. Cleveland was part of our 2020 group. And this annual program is a way to bring a cohort of local governments together to um, work towards certification, have tools and resources and share ideas along the way. Currently, we're launching a regional program in the state of Florida that will kick off in January. So we've seen a lot of interest in the state. And so we're going to kind of tailor the program for um, participants there to work towards certification together. And this is something we would like to do um, 
around around the country. We, we see a lot of benefit of local cohorts kind of um, leveraging their voice to engage maybe their utilities or other other entities that they need to get information from. And it's a good way to, to go together. I know that Shaker in Cleveland were able to collaborate on some of their submission as well. So a lot of benefit there. So if there's a handful in, in Northeast Ohio, we, we would love to, to work with you there. Um, so Lead for Cities is really guided by um, a set of program goals. Um, and, and these are to really inspire leadership, transformation and innovation in urban sustainability, protect biodiversity and regenerate ecosystem services, meet and exceed net zero for carbon, energy, water, and waste, and achieve livability, choice, and access for all where people live, work, and play, and to raise the standard of living and quality of life for humans around the globe. So these are really our, our guiding principles that help to shape the work that we do. And this is reflected in our, our rating system scorecard. So I think Jason showed this yesterday morning um, in his kickoff to, to show how the, the city performed, but um, the rating system scorecard is showing kind of basically everything that cities are both required to submit on and have the option to submit on with the credits. We have nine main categories, everything from natural systems that kind of looks at the green side of the environment to transportation, um, energy and greenhouse gas emissions, and a section on quality of life, as well as waste and water. Um, and equity is, is, is woven throughout the rating system as far as um, how resources are distributed um, and and processes are in place to, to ensure an equitable community. So the rating system, those credits or those categories are really made up of both prerequisites and credits. Um, the prerequisites come in the form of both base conditions and performance prerequisites. And we'll just kind of dig into the weeds a little bit here at this high level so you know what, what the city had to go through to, to get certified. So our base condition prerequisites are not worth any points, but they are required to go through. And they are looking at both um, access and quality as well as, as general assessments. So the ecosystem assessment is really looking at the relationship to the built environment and the natural world and how planning decisions are made related to the natural world and um, how, how the city is built around it. The demographic assessment on the bottom is in our quality of life category and ask cities to um, go through mapping exercises to show the distribution of, um, of wealth, of education, of, of race, and other socio-cultural socio uh, indicators, and really see the relationship between those and distribution within the city. Um, the three other access and quality around water, energy, and materials and resources is asking for um, showing that you meet essential environmental standards and qualities, quality standards really from the state and federal government, as well as that these um, services are provided to the whole community. The performance prerequisites are where points start to come into play. And so communities in input data into our ARC platform for VMT per capita, GHG per capita, um, a slew of quality of life indicators around education, equitability, prosperity, and health and safety. And a score is provided based on performance relative to our data set, which is um, full of other cities uh, around the globe. So the, the performance there um, kind of gives you an indicator of how you stand up relative to other cities. Digging into what the credits um, look at and you know the credit the prerequisites obviously are all required credits are optional and they kind of come in two different forms with outcomes and strategies um and sometimes a combination of both so cities pursue the credits that they are doing or that they are meeting um some of the outcome type measurements look at access to green space um the density of compact and complete communities and access to resources within those and whereas the strategies are more policy based. So looking at housing policies, looking at different transportation policies, things along those lines. And a quick look at the breakdown of scoring. Um, the, the performance prerequisites provide their up to 36 points and the credits are up to 64 points. So credits make up the majority of the rating system. And, and we hope that as, as cities achieve credits, that starts to meet, move the needle in that performance um, category. 
how the points translate to certification levels, um, 40 plus certified, 50 silver, 60 gold, and 80 platinum. Currently in um, the, the, this version of Lead for Cities, there have not been any platinum certifications. Um, most certifications fall in the silver to gold range um, with um, some falling down into certified. I believe Shaker was gold um, and Cincinnati was silver. Any questions on kind of the, the framework before I dig into a little bit about why, why people are choosing to go through this process? So David, I haven't seen me pop into the chat yet. Okay. So I think if you just want to keep rolling along, right. um, yeah. I got a hunch we'll get more questions when we get into the Cleveland stuff. Yeah, good. Okay. So um, why are, why do cities certify, you know, one thing is to help provide that baseline assessment to know where you stand today in terms of sustainability and then um, how to how to move forward, how to address gaps that, that might arise. And um, having a, a robust kind of independently verified assessment provides a lot of value to cities to make decisions and investments along the way. Um, you know, Lead for Cities certification really helps you identify your strengths and weaknesses, as well as gaps and opportunities for improvement. Social equity is one of the areas that local governments are focused on from an improvement and investment perspective right now. So from increasing the diversity of boards and commissions, which is a credit within the rating system, to ensuring all neighborhoods have access to green space and really considering equity and pandemic planning. Um, going through these different credits that ask cities to reflect on that and submit on it um, helps to drive um, the, the equity work. The Lead for Cities is really also helping to institutionalize sustainability. And it's good to hear Jason talk about in a couple of sessions, you're going to dig into that a bit more of um, how, how can you use these principles of Lead for Cities to create a culture of sustainability how can you do what Las Vegas did, which is uh, put specific Lead for Cities and Star Communities indicators into their master plan to track progress along over time um, by, by including these things into those processes and, and um, engaging everyone on a deeper level around sustainability, you can really create that culture of sustainability to make advances. And that's something that we hear time and again is one of the, the most valuable processes of this. So. Um, not only is it helping to advance um, the goals and ambitions of leaders and, and mayors around the country, it's also focusing on um, how this is a long-term commitment to, to reach those goals. Um, sustainability can be hard work, and especially our goals of, of net zero and, and reading and meeting um, greenhouse gas emission reductions by 2030 and 2050 can be, um, can be daunting at times. And so this is a way to kind of clearly track your progress for a long time. And, you know, it's also important to celebrate your successes. So I think it's a big deal that, that uh, Cleveland, you know, receives this, received this silver certification. Um, it should be, it should be celebrated and then, and then dig into the work that needs to be done next to get to, get to gold, to get to platinum. All right. So um, Cleveland certification, I want to dig into this a bit, give you a high level overview. Again, drop questions as they come up, but um, looking at the, the overall scorecard, um, 57, 57 points, um, just seeing that there, it says gold, but it is silver. <laughs> um, the, the certification, um, looking at the performance score and how the city, again, these performance prerequisites are put into our ARC platform. The score is given on how you perform relative to peers. So transportation, water, um, full credit, really, really strong performances there. Um, as we kind of knew from the get-go, energy emissions and performance, which is greenhouse gas emissions per capita, um, is we'll put it as an area of opportunity. A lot of growth can, can be achieved there. And, and this is so much determined by um, just the mix of the grid. Places that are blessed with the cleaner grid um, obviously perform a lot better there. And this, is, this isn't speaking to anything about the actions that are being done. It's, it's surely... Is purely just the performance at this point in time. Waste, um, that 43 out of 100, for the 40 point mark is about the average for the US. So it's right around average and same with quality of quality of life. Overall, looking at the categories, 
Um, again, you know, a good performance overall, the transportation score is probably a little bit higher than most cities and communities, which is solid. Um, same water efficiency is a really high score. Energy is, again, an area for growth. And the one out of 10 in materials and resources, um, yeah, that's rough. Um, but it's also about average for, for what we're seeing. It, we're, there's, there's kind of two things going on in materials and resources. One, um, we, as a country, as cities in, this, in the U.S., we create too much waste. We're, we really have a high generation per capita, and that is reflected in, in the score and that performance score. Um, the second thing is, um, as I said, we're in beta, and some of the credits that, that we have in the rating system need to be tweaked to make them more accessible to cities and communities. That's not necessarily making them easier at all, just making them um, align with the work that is being done by cities and communities. So we'll dig into each category a little bit more now. So integrative process is looking at how um, cities are both um, aligned and work together, kind of integrate processes within um, the local government to, to address sustainability and comp plans, strategic plans, things like that. And then what's the city did achieve the point for that? And then the green building policy incentives, the city received some points for tax abatements and for um, um, energy tracking, building energy tracking. Natural systems and ecology is a bit more on that, that green side um, uh, of sustainability. So access to green spaces, as Jason mentioned yesterday, a lot of growth has happened there to get the points for it. It is looking about at um, both meeting a, a threshold. So 394 square feet per person is what Cleveland had. And our threshold for achieving that was 121. So really kind of blew it out of the water. And then the other part of that is that at least 70% of residents are within a half mile walk to the to a park and Cleveland is at 83%. So a really strong performance in the screen spaces category. Um, looking back at the other categories, natural resources, conservation and restoration. This is often a hard one for cities to capture. Counties perform a little bit better on that one because it's looking at um, having large swaths of acreage that provide those ecosystem services. Green spaces is a little bit more on the park side, the human interaction with green spaces. Natural resources is a little bit more on the ecosystem services. Um, and then it's good to see the resilience planning credit that you know, the city does have plans and, and processes in place to address um, adaptation, mitigation, and resilience. Our transportation and land use category is really looking at um, mobility services that are provided and how planning um, helps to create a more walkable, dense um, community. So um, really well performance on, on the, the transportation that VMT per capita, full points there. Um, other areas that, that did well was the access to quality transit. I think that the, the city submitted, this one's looking at that you have a um, a transportation hub that has multi-modal connections to it. So the assessment that the city did was for the Tower City Station and the different connections there. Hey, David, yeah. um, we did get a question um, that I think might be worth kind of mentioning as we get through this. Um, does Lead for Cities track enforcement of policy in validating credits awarded? Um, so around different policies. Uh, you know, for an example would be our smart mobility and transportation policies. We, we asked that at least um, things like 50% of the roadways are applied to the, the smart technologies applied to 50% of the roadways, but um, we don't audit at a deep, deep level of, you know, how, you know, the historic preservation is in high priority of sites, you know, how is that applied? We don't have the ability to kind of go that deep, but the cities do have to provide, um, you know, sign statements that they are meeting it and and things like that. But I think what that gets at is that um, how are these policies affecting the performance? So if you have several policies that um, are in place, but the performance scores are still low, then then we might need to reevaluate the policies. Um, David, if I can, just to chime in as someone who's gone through the, the reporting on, on the city side, um, I, I would agree that I don't think it's quite as strong in terms of making sure we are 
um, address or in terms of how we are enforcing. Um, it's more about making sure those policies are established. However, I expect that the certification is going to evolve as we keep trying to achieve platinum, and there may be some more, you know, focus on enforcement as lead you know, just continues to um, kind of drive those metrics that mm -hmm. are showing the progress. So um, I think we're in, in our office trying to make sure that as we're adopting policies that we're prepared to be able to enforce them as well. So I'll let you keep going. But that was a great question. Um, I have another one if you want me to yeah, just keep jump going. in. Um, is there annual reporting for lead for cities on each of the credits earned? And I think you may be touching on yeah, this no, a little bit later. So if we come to it, let me know. No, that's a good question. So um, it, cities are expected to recertify every five years. So, uh, and, and that might not be the entire, entire um, assessment again, but providing updates on credit and submitting new credits. And then on the performance side, those indicators that go into ARC, they, they do have the ability to use that platform to update those indicators on an annual basis as data comes in um, to see how they improve, but we won't be verifying it. I mean, things like the, the quality of life indicators are mostly coming from the census. So that data is out annually. So you can input that to see how things are fluctuating, but things like a greenhouse gas inventory, I don't know. Um, can't remember if you'll do an annual one or not, but most cities are not doing annual greenhouse gas inventories because it's such a big lift. Um, but things like that, it, it is available. We are not certifying it on an annual basis. And David, uh, what I, I'll add there, one of the things that we want to do um, is we put so much time and energy into this Lead for City certifications. We want to start to pull some of these measures into our dashboard. Um, so shameless plug. Uh, the third session of uh, that we're going to go through, we'll really start to look at how we're going to do that. But I think our intention is to pull some of the key measurements from Lead for Cities and start to do annual tracking, even if it's not through the actual certification process, just through our, our public dashboard so we can be a little more accountable. And, you know, I think the one thing that we're all, always trying to strike a balance with is um, there is a lot of work for city sustainability offices to do, as you can tell. They are very busy people and they have a lot of action that needs to be taken. These processes to verify that action, to help give them a pathway forward are extremely important, but there's a balance between reporting and doing things. And we want to streamline that process so that the reporting side is straightforward and easy and not cumbersome so that they can spend as much time as possible on, on taking action. Um, and, you know, we are one of other types of reports cities do, you know, we, we really are a holistic look at sustainability, but things like the CDP reporting is, is focused on um, carbon and that's a very intensive report. And there's a handful of others that cities are often engaged in. All right, I'll go keep going through the rest of these. So water efficiency, looking at um, different, uh, the relationship between consumption of water, um, maintenance of the system, and um, kind of water, the integrated water management, which um, is a good one for you all, is looking at that you're not overusing your water resources. Um, you all are blessed with a very large water resource and um, have really strong performance in the management of the water system. Um, Stormwater management, the city did not get credit there. And this one is a tough credit often because it is um, one, we need to tweak it a little bit. It's, it's not written in a way that's super approachable for cities and capturing the work that's being done as far as green infrastructure goes. Um, and also it, it, for cities that have gotten it, it often is looking at a very large portion of the city um, has green infrastructure services. So it's one that some have gotten and some have not. So one to look into. Energy and greenhouse gas emissions category. Um, again, one that has a lot of opportunity. Uh, the city did get points for energy efficiency for a really robust um, and well-tracked update to LED streetlights to help reduce emissions there and, and create um, uh, um, less energy usage from the streetlights. Um, the low carbon economy looks at the relationship between emissions and GDP. And then grid harmonization is looking at things like net metering and um, the different policies are in place to help encourage uh, less energy usage. And materials and resources is a rough category for most. I think the average score here 
is um, about two points. So not far off. Um, part of that is, like I said, we are seeing that just cities are performing poorly with waste. Um, it is something, especially in recent years, as kind of the market for recycling has shifted so dramatically. And then some of these other credits that we have, like material recovery and responsible sourcing for infrastructure, we, we are working on tweaking those through our addenda process to make them um, align with the work that cities are doing. Last category, quality of life. Um, the city um, did about average in the, in the performance for the US. And then trend improvements looks at several of those performance indicators like um, high school degree, bachelor's degree, median income, unemployment, um, and it asks, you know, how over time are you improving? And so the city was able to demonstrate improvements over time for several of those indicators. And that's reflected in that four out of four points for, for trend improvements. I want to skip down to the innovation category <coughs> as the innovation category provides an opportunity to um, receive points for things that, that cities are doing that are not really captured by the rating system. So gaps in a way. Um, city got six out of six points for, for um, really good submissions in, in the innovation category. One that we wanted to highlight that was a really strong submission was the economic justice credit. Essentially cities are creating credits that they are doing and how they meet them. So this credit was uh, really about um, the neighborhood transformation initiative. Um, of Mayor Jackson's and how how um, communities that are historically disrupted in its economic viability through economic justice. So fostering a just economy where prosperity and justice go hand in hand rather than in opposition to, to one another. The state provided clear metrics on how they're making progress here and how programs and policies are in place to address these issues. And then the last category, again, the city received four out of four points for, for was regional priority. And this is looking at things that go beyond the scope of the jurisdiction's boundaries that um, help to advance priorities. So um, one that was submitted was Sustainable Cleveland about how it's, how it's yes, it's focused on the city, but it's bringing um, community partners from across the region together to really create a more sustainable Northeast Ohio. Okay. That was a lot of information that I ran through and um, in the weeds at points, but a little high level too. So I'm happy to kind of bring in, you know, we could look at the scorecard more or dig into the weeds. Um, but yeah, happy to take some questions. Okay, thanks, David. Uh, so remember, if you want, just drop your questions in the chat. Um, while we're waiting for folks to throw some things in there, David, I, I guess I'll start. So. You know, I think, you know, as you looked at, at, at the Cleveland application, was there anything that kind of stood out as interesting or unique or um, you were kind of surprised by as we kind of submitted this application that maybe you haven't seen in other places, both good and bad? Because uh, I think we've got to be honest about both of those things. Yeah, I mean, I do want to say that looking at the transportation um, category, um, the, the access to quality transit is a strong credit of having multimodal options within the city, that that is available. Um, I think that, that that was a good one to see. And then, um, you know, where we see some of the most interesting stuff time and again is that innovation category. As I mentioned, the, the, um, the program that I highlighted, but it is also, I think that you submitted on, um, you know, how you responded to the pandemic with philanthropy. Um, the Lead Safe Home Fund was was submitted down there and received credit. Um, and then I, I think another category that you're proud of, Jason, is water. You got you got just about all the points in water, um, and that is a reflection of the city's commitment to um, the resources. Great. So uh, I think we've got a question here from from Nicole Sticka from our. our Greater Cleveland Partnership, our local chamber here. And she asked, um, kind of which stakeholders are most critical to the city to help advance these goals and points? Uh, and maybe kind of thinking not just in Cleveland, but as you looked at applications from cities across the United States and across the world, uh, 
how do you see kind of the interplay with all these diverse stakeholders and, and what do those successful platinum applications have in common from a stakeholder engagement collaboration standpoint? Ooh, and Jason, um, I had a question for you, so I'm going to do a two-parter here. Oh, no. um, I know, that's not, right? That's not part of the deal. Uh, so, surprise! Good morning. Um, uh, when you think of our engage, how has the the lead process helped you better engage with our city departments as stakeholders? As just as you think of our experience going through it, um, you can think about it maybe while David uh, answers Nicole's question. Yeah. Um... I think that the most successful places have really strong leadership, whether it is um, at the mayoral level or departments or just in the community, and then also empowering those down the line to go out and do the work. So empowering your sustainability staff and maybe other divisions to see their role in sustainability, how they their specific job relates to meeting these broader goals. I think that's, that is essential to driving progress. Um, Broader speaking in the community, I think that um, looking, I mean, the energy and greenhouse gas emissions category is one that utilities have to be deeply engaged in. And um, as you kind of touched on yesterday that, you know, this is this is beyond the city, this is state policy, and that hopefully some some changes can happen along the way. I'm in Kentucky, we're, we're uh, maybe worse, you know, it's it's not great as far as pushing pushing change at, at that level, it's hard, but cities are, are doing the best they can. Um, you know, look, just looking at the, I think one good thing about the poor performances across the board and materials and resources for all cities is they are looking back at contracts with waste haulers to understand, um, okay, well, you need to be giving me the data I need and we need, to, we need to dig deeper about things like construction and demolition waste. Where is it going? How are we tracking it? Are we diverting it? And so I think that we're seeing um, some good conversations being had related to waste um, across the across the board. And I think that the Circular Cleveland um, initiative, and I want to dig into the report, is really cool. And I'm excited to see see progress there and see others um, take on this challenge as well. One thing that we've seen also is places like Cleveland, or sorry, like Orlando, have used their certification to engage their community foundation to fund specific projects. So they've gone to the community foundation and said, hey, our lead for cities assessment showed that we did poor in you know, this specific credit. Here's a project we know that can help drive change there. Can you help partner with us to implement a project? So I guess, Kristen, the second part of your question is, is how has it helped us as we've kind of engaged with city departments? Um, you know, I think a lot of times at the city level, we kind of do what we do and we don't necessarily, it, it's our jobs. So we just kind of come and we do it and, and folks are just working and working and working. This was a great way, I think, for us to step back and kind of stop and engage and have some discussion with those departments to say, the things that you're doing are really interesting um, and they're really kind of helpful and impactful. And I think we've been fairly successful as a city at ingraining sustainability throughout different departments and divisions. Um, and I think that's why we saw some of those performances in our community development aspect and some of the things on the transportation side through city planning. Um, and then the really, really strong performance through our utilities department um, around the water usage and then um, in conjunction with the sewer district on some of the wastewater, stormwater management things. Um, and then some of the things that we did get some of the credits for in the greenhouse gas emissions. I, I think the, the LED streetlight program really helped us advance on some of those energy efficiency programs. Um, you know, I think we've got some room to grow there and some things to do, but it's been very helpful to start those conversations. And I think David touched on this in his presentation. For us, this really is a well, well thought out gap analysis, for lack of a better term, about where we are and where we want to get to. And this gives us a pathway to get there, and it's going to really help facilitate that engagement moving forward, I think, in a much, much more meaningful way. Yeah, and I think digging into, you know, obviously the credits you didn't get, and things like distributional equity and compact mixed use and transit oriented development are really full of those are important assessments to do and to understand why you aren't performing well. And then so distributional equity is looking at not just what is the median income of a city or or what is the average 
um, educational level, but looking at across different sociocultural groups, where do people perform and, and kind of why are they performing poorly in, in different areas or not meeting those thresholds? Um, and so how could resources be funneled to those areas to improve? Um, and that the mapping exercises also help you to really see some of the um, historical um, disenfranchisement that happens in cities. Um, and if I can just chime in from sort of the reporting aspect um, in especially some of the like, for example, the compact and complete centers. So sort of looking at, you know, in around a given point, do these residents have access to kind of anything that a person would need from, you know, healthcare, education, retail, food access, it's transportation. Um, I think when I, that was not an area that we necessarily scored well in, but it wasn't for lack of progress. I think we just um, didn't have maybe those distinct centers. There were a few that checked off some of the boxes, but maybe not all. So maybe those are what we look at as sort of low hanging fruit so that we can, you know, start to establish more of those um, kind of hubs around the city that have everything a resident may need. Yeah. Looks like there's a few questions in the chat I could I could get through. So what did you mean average for quality of life transportation? So um, the ARC platform where you get these performance prerequisites is full of a data set of different um, cities around the globe. And that 40 out of 100 point mark is um, typically an average for the U.S. So I think um, for water example, you hit the 40 point mark when you're about 90 gallons per per capita daily water consumption. Um, I think transportation is in the, the 20, 20 miles traveled daily per capita. So to get to that kind of 40 point mark you're, is, a, is usually when you've hit the US average. Um, the threshold for, for getting credit in renewable energy. So renewable energy is looking at um, the percent of both electricity and thermal energy consumed by the city in an annual basis um, and what percentage of that is coming from renewable sources. And I think that you have to be to get at least one point is 1% um, of, of, the, of the grid is renewable. This one um, has been tough. <laughs> one, we, we just rewrote the credit last spring to make it um, more straightforward and to um, uh, since it's looking at community-wide not just um, city operations lots of cities have done a good job making their operations their recs and other things greener but this is across the entire community Um, David, a, a question I had for you is, you know, just based on what you've seen kind of going from, well, essentially from STAR to LEED to LEED 4.1, um, you know, where do you kind of see the evolution of the, the LEED rating system going? Um, you know, I think some of it, um, and then Jason, I know uh, Nicole had asked a, a question earlier that might be some good, uh, a good teaser. Um, if you can maybe hint at some of the uh, techniques and plans that are gonna get us to gold. Um, David, we're ultimately looking to get to platinum. Um, that may take us a few years. And if the, the system evolves over that time, you know, can you help us make sure we're prepared yeah. uh, for any, any changes that might come? Yeah, I also, I think I wanna to touch on one other part of Divya's question is that um, about legacy cities or, or similar cities in population about the averages, but that just kind of spurred my thought on, you know, Cincinnati was also silver. Louisville is submitting soonish, and I think they'll be in that that silver range. And I think that that speaks to our energy and greenhouse gas emissions category has a ton of points. And so these cities that do have a more manufacturing history, a dirtier grid, you know, they're not going to perform as well. Every city that's gone through it in Florida has gotten gold, and that is, you can look at their performance in that category specifically and see they're getting a lot more points in greenhouse gas emissions performance. And so that is a, a clear area that um, hopefully as we have cleaner goods, we'll see better performance in. Um, and so going back to the evolution of, of Leap for Cities, you know, STAR, um, 
star definitely helped inform this and and go we really wanted to streamline the process star had about 550 different things you could report on and it was a beast to go through lead for cities boiled that down um in the best way we could to not lose the the kind of um value of all those of all the information and to make it more of a streamlined process so i think that we hope to continue to make it a more streamlined process as i said we're in beta in the the lead world you're in beta we can make changes through an addenda process i think next spring we hope to clean up some of these credits that we see are not accessible to um, cities and communities with input from from cities we work with and input from our, our working group and then what happens is uh, about 18 months from now probably we'll go through um, a will be balloted through lead all lead products are balloted and and approved and will be official official so um, I think that the performance side will, will probably look pretty similar but there will be some credits that are are more in line with um, how cities operate. The recertification process is another one that we're looking at how to how that will look. And most likely it will probably be updating your, your performance score um, and then indicating how you're still meeting the credits you achieved and submitting new ones if, if you'd like. But um, it's a stakeholder process, so you will have the power to help influence and dictate where it goes. Um, I can just quickly speak as someone who was part of the city's uh, STAR certification and then uh, LEAD. I, I very much agree. STAR was a bit overwhelming, and I think we had a big sigh of relief when we learned that STAR was uh, transitioning to LEAD for cities and we weren't going to have to to go through it again. Um, as much as I appreciated sort of the comprehensive nature of it, it covered everything. Um, it is. It, it was... It was intense to to go through. I mean, it took probably four of our staff to like working pretty regularly to make sure we were um, on top of it. Lead was much more digestible, and I'm hoping the recertification will be be better. Um, yeah. Jason, I know there was a, a piece for you there, so I'm sorry for jumping in, but one addition. Uh, I think yeah, I think part of it is is just what David said. As we look to that next round, it's we've got to figure out how to tackle the energy and greenhouse gas portions. And I think uh, a lot of the work that we put into the clean energy plan that we released earlier this year and a lot of the discussion that we had in the session yesterday on clean energy generation is a good start. Um, it's continuing to work with our utility partners as much as we can. Cleveland Public Power, um, we've got to figure out how to have those discussions with, with CEI. And I think at an organizational level, I think you'll hear a little bit of this in the next, um, the next kind of lead session where we start to see what some folks are doing as organizations how do we begin to help drive this change so what does our collective purchasing power do for us both on an energy side but then also as we start to look at materials and resources and uh, how do we start to kind of try to advance some of these things a little bit more effectively um, but I, I think i think we just need to dig in and, and kind of move forward on these these big areas um, particularly energy and greenhouse gas it just i think we were surprised a little bit honestly um, as we went through the the effort, because we've had such a focus on it here for so long in Cleveland on greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I, I think that was was candidly a little bit of a surprise to us um, and that um, for all of the good work that we've done, we've got a ways to go. And there are some structural things that are tied up in that. There are kind of policy things that are beyond our control, but we need to keep keep moving and keep advancing that. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, David, you touched on this on the, um, you know, just industrial nature of Cleveland. And I, you know, I want to give a shout out to some of our, our big industry folks as well. You know, a lot of our steel mills are, they're being much more efficient. Um, they're also being much more productive. So um, it is finding that balance too of, you know, growing our economy, but not kind of dealing with some of those impacts. My hope is, um, you know, Circular Cleveland is going to help also kind of be an intervention for that and you know as we get the roadmaps going to give us some really clear targets to start making some big impacts yeah and i think that you know that that is part of the storytelling of this certification that of course places that that don't have the that type of um, economic sector are going to do well and you know you all shouldn't necessarily be penalized for that it's, you got to tell the story of, of the work you are doing to improve in that sector and um, you know, as it evolves over time, I think that one thing about the kind of sustainability movement that we've seen in cities of the past decade is, um, 
you know, a lot of it at first was very green focused and recycling and things like that. And we've seen a huge shift into action around climate because that's the reality we're facing. And I think that as we see more energy action plans and more um, kind of climate adaptation plans, we'll only see increases um, in performance here. Um, are there any other questions for David or Jason? Um, I think maybe, if not, maybe I'll just ask you guys and we can wrap up a couple of minutes early if need be and give everybody a few minutes to, to take a break. Um, are, are any kind of closing thoughts about the process um, or what's next for us or just, you know, overall sentiments around uh, Lead for Cities? Because I think uh, we were, a lot of us were very excited to make the announcement yesterday about the silver certification. I know I was personally, uh, when we started it, I was like, I just hope we're certified. I hope we get certified. Uh, and then as we were doing it and getting closer to uh, 50 points, and then we, Jason kept going, we might get gold. And I'm like, Jason, don't get our hopes up. I want to keep my expectations nice and low so that we aren't disappointed if we don't get it. Um, it was a little tough falling just a few points shy, but I think then it's going to give us a, a good opportunity to show some uh, progress as we get to our next certification. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it over to you guys, but I, uh, I appreciate that we got to have this session and uh, glad everybody got to kind of hear how we got there. I'll say, um, you know, it was, it was really nice working with the two of you as well as Depot in the process that uh, Cincinnati is lucky to have a talented, sorry, Cleveland, OCs, Ohio OCs. Cleveland's lucky to have, um, you know, a talented staff to help drive the work forward. Uh, and like I said, both the cities I work with around the country, seeing the importance of strong leadership within staff is really going to make a huge difference. So um, Cleveland, you, you got you got some good people on your side. And, um, you know, I think the other thing that we've seen, again, in different states like North Carolina, Southern, Southern California and Florida is um, hubs of activities around certifications help to drive um, progress across the board. So I'm hopeful that we can work with more, more cities and counties in Ohio and in Northeast Ohio to help drive progress along the way and, and use you all as, as mentors to those folks as they, as they push for certification. Thanks. No, I, I think that's a really good encapsulation, David. And, and I think it, not just saying this because you're you're here with us, but the level of support from both you and, and Hillary as we kind of work through this process is um, it, it's, it's really great to have that kind of support and partnership as you go through these processes. Um, so, um, you know, a lot of good work happened here locally, but we certainly felt better as we talked to you guys more and more and more over the last year plus as we work through this. And of course, you mentioned Deepa. I don't know that Deepa is here. I think she has another commitment today. Uh, we would not have been able to do this without Deepa and all the hard work she did pulling the, the first part of this together. So um, if she's not here, the next time you see Deepa, everybody tell her thank you. And, and she did good work on this. And, um, you know, but I think, uh, yeah, this is good. And, and I think if we wrap it up quickly, we'll uh, see everybody at the next session to start talking about how we get better even. Yes, that sounds great. Um, I've been dropping in the chat, but if you're able to join us at 1045, we're going to be doing a planning for platinum session. And then um, a, a connected session is later this afternoon at 215 on our sustainable Cleveland dashboard. And how do we take all of these metrics and tell the community that we are becoming a green city on a blue lake? Uh, so that one's going to be more interactive. And if uh, you're available to join us, we'd love, love to see you. All right, so have a, a good morning, everyone. We'll see you uh, hopefully later today.